uh, coming up for breast cancer and requesting prayers for her. And then uh, Sandy had a schoolmate, Steve Waite. Uh, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer and requesting prayers for him. And then, uh, of course, remember uh, Dee Dee Lancaster's family and loss of her brother, and then uh, uh, Miss Shirley's loss uh, in their family. Uh, so, need to remember all of those uh, in your prayers also. Those are the updates and reminders I've got. Anything else need to be mentioned? you pray with me father god we humbly come before you so grateful for giving us life for loving us and blessing us we pray father that you'd be with those that are dealing with cancer we ask your healing on them we pray father that you'd be with those who have lost loved ones we all ask father that uh, we need to be restored physically, mentally, and most, most importantly, spiritually. With all the craziness that's going on in the world, Lord, we thank you for the comfort that we have in knowing that you are the one that's in control. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to do our best to be what you would have us to be, and that's to show kindness and love as you have for mankind when you sent Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for the examples that you have set for us through your humbleness, your patience, your love, and mercy. We ask, Father, that you'd be with us as we go through this Bible study, that we could take it, apply it to our lives, that others could see Jesus living in us, and they would want what we have, and that is the the joy of knowing that we have something much better after this life. Forgive us of our sins in Jesus. Amen. Dylan and I already loaded those songs. There you go. One of my favorites. Uh, all five verses. Um, if you're using a book and you need to use that, after Terry's lesson tonight, it's going to be 679. Uh, 679 is they'll know we're Christians by our love. And before Terry's lesson. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word when each can feel his brother's sigh and with him bear a part when sorrow flows from eye to eye and and joy from heart to heart. When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes all above, each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. When love in one delightful stream through every bosom flows, when union sweet and dear esteem in every action glows, love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above, and he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. Good evening. Good evening. 
Today's thoughts are going to come from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 30, if you want to read along. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How many of us have withheld forgiveness because the other person never apologized for a wrongdoing? We may think that punishes the offender, but unforgiveness destroys us and also trickles down to hurt others. When someone harms us, we may feel that person doesn't deserve the pardon, but neither are we deserving of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That's why the Lord calls us to follow his example of extending grace. Crucifixion was slow and agonizing, but Jesus' worst torment occurred when the sin of the world was laid on him and his father turned away. Even so, as the crowd cast lots for his garments, Jesus gave us the best possible example, forgiveness by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Forgiveness is a choice, an act of service to God, and a necessary step in our healing. He wants us to give up the right to punish those who hurt us, even if it's in a mindset change that takes place only within our heart. Others may not know your pain. Be assured that Jesus does. With his infinite love and gentleness, he'll help you overcome hurt, anger, and bitterness. If you are here tonight and there's something on your heart, or if you've never put on the armor of God, we can help you with that. If you want to, please, please come forward as we stand and sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you, brother. Class time. Good evening. Good evening. 
Hope everybody is doing well tonight. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and chapter 11, and we're going to start chapter 12. So, overly ambitious goals for tonight, but um, as a result, I asked Kenny to hold off on ringing that first bell until about 7.55. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Well, we'll try to stay on schedule here. Um, we are going to go through this rather quickly, but if anyone has a question or comment, please do not hesitate to stop me um, because we definitely want to address them. There is a lot to cover in these sections. So with that, we're going to talk about two major issues here um, through these verses. Um, and those major issues that Paul's going to address here is the validity of Paul's own apostleship and then the danger of false apostles. And he's specifically talking about false apostles and their danger, their troubles. Um, but as I think about the context that it applies to us today, I don't think it's unreasonable to extend this to false teachers um, as well. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go through this. But these are things, these are themes that we've talked about in the past that Paul has been building up throughout this letter. Um, and we're going to try to bring some conclusions to it tonight. So first, how do we measure an apostle? Um, turn with me, if you will, to uh, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 10 here. This is where we're going to start. How do we measure an apostle? Um, first way, we measure an apostle through spiritual power, not physical prowess. Um, I think that's a truth we would know today. Um, so I think as I look out here, I'm probably the biggest person here physically. I don't think that's a, a stretch. Dennis, you want, might challenge me on it. But my physical prowess, or what it used to be, <laughs> doesn't dictate my spiritual power, my spiritual abilities. And that's what Paul's um, going to start to point out in some of these verses, but really in the whole context of here as we think about it. Oh, let's read with, read with me here, if you will. Um, this is chapter 10, starting in verse 1. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble, when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg you that when I am present... I may not have to show you boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk according to the flesh, we are not waging war against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So, Paul's general attitude is not to be confused for weakness. Um, you know, it's possible to think, it's possible that some of the Corinthians think that Paul doesn't have authority because he doesn't speak boldly in person. He is, um, for what we can glean from the text, um, he has, we're going to talk about this later on, but he has some sort of thorn in the flesh, some sort of physical impediment. Um, he talks about being um, meek in his speech or not a good speaker. And so um, he's not a, it appears that he is not some sort of um, physical presence in any way. Um, but that's not what makes someone special. That's not what that's not how God judges someone. That's not how. Um, that's not how Paul is valued as apostle. He's valued because of his spiritual um, power, um, or his physical state. Definitely, is not a reflection of his spiritual power. Um, another thing to point out here: Paul and the other apostles, true apostles, are focused on the spiritual battle that lies ahead of them. They're not focused on. Um, earthly challenges. It, it talks there, what is that in verse, uh, verse um, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power and destroy strongholds. He is seeking something um, different than what, you know, 
worldly power looks like, what, what, how we think of traditional power. Um, that's the embodiment of what an apostle is. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to keep going through here, but really Paul is not fighting against um, physical people or, or people as such. Um, even though he's been talking about these false apostles, he really feels that he is fighting against Satan. And we're, that's going to bear out as we um, go further down into this chapter. The next thought on how we measure an apostle is their position in relation to Christ. Let's look at verse, starting in verse 7 here. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is in Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is, in, just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building up, or which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. Um, Paul knows his position with Christ. Um, he feels that he will not be put to shame relative to anyone else, relative to these false apostles um, or any of his naysayers or detractors. Um, he knows the position, the relationship that's been bestowed upon him um, from Christ when he first um, encountered Christ on that road to Damascus. Um, and that's another important point here. Paul has directly received this authority from Christ in building up um, these Corinthians, something only 12 other men can really boast of. Um, this isn't, you know, these aren't self-appointed positions. I think we talked about this um, when we started uh, 2 Corinthians here, but the idea that um, any sort of power or authority or leadership in position in the church, it comes because it's been bestowed upon you. So the apostles were bestowed apostles um, because of Christ bestowing that on them. Right? That's not you don't get to nominate yourself as an apostle. Um, and we used we kind of talked about too. I think at that time the idea of like elders here. So no one comes up and stands before you and says, well, I'm an elder, or I nominate myself as an elder. It's the power that's given to them by the church, by the local church. Um, any questions or thoughts on that? How do we measure an apostle? Through the deeds done through Christ. Look at here, um, picking up in verse 10 again. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is meek, and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Um, and this comes back to that idea that we first talked about, his, his spiritual power um, not being defined by his physical prowess, right? So Paul, I think Paul, I mean, from my vantage point now, the, the great gift that Paul has from a spiritual standpoint is the inspired letters that he's given us. I mean, that's, that's what we carry today um, and what we have. And, and I mean, I, I think he's, he's written more than any other of the New Testament writers, from, at least from a, a volume standpoint. Um, but he, the idea that his physical presence, um, you know, is not imposing, it's not dictating, but he's still doing his deeds through Christ, um, and he's still delivering um, these great things for him. And so whether, even though Paul's bodily presence is weak or meek, and he doesn't speak good, it doesn't take anything away from his authority um, as apostle. Um, Paul is able to back what he says in his letters despite um, his appearance because of what he is doing and that is being done through Christ, um, not something that these false apostles can claim, um, at least in truth. Um, moving on, um, the apostles, their ministry was assigned to them by God, something Paul points out here, starting in verse 12. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when, we measure themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. 
But we will not boast beyond limits, but, we, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned us to reach even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limits in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Um, so Paul here, he is, he is focusing, he's highlighting here the importance of um, the ministry and the area of influence that God has assigned to him. Um, and that is over this area of Corinth. Um, and really, he's writing to the larger area of Achaia here as well. And so Paul's saying here, I have been given this by God. This has been assigned to me by God to deliver um, to you for your benefit. Um, you know, and again, it's not that Paul... Um, you know, the idea that these, these false apostles, they continue to commend themselves and, and speak. I, it, it appears that they are comparing themselves and their quote-unquote greatness against what Paul's attributes are. Um, you know, and, but at the end of the day, it's about their spiritual truth um, and the God-bestowed power that, that Paul has received as compared to what they haven't received. Um, and so... Their measure, the measure of an apostle is dictated by the ministry assigned by God. Any questions before we kind of wrap up these thoughts on this section here? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that, you know, because it's really, it's, it, it, God is a standard. It's, it's not what human earthly eyes think and, and, or, or how the world views things, and that's really the whole of Christianity. You know, the Jews, they struggled with that. They, they were thinking that the coming of the Christ was going to mean one thing, uh, really a physical power, not a spiritual revolution. Um, and so... You know, but still throughout history, people want to tie in physical power um, to this thing um, in many ways. So, no, thank you for that point. Um, were you going to say something, Wilfred? Or? Well, I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but another characteristic we all know is here is that they had to be a witness of Christ. They had to have seen him and been with him. Now, Paul's exception is different in that he was not with him, but he, he met him and, and uh, had that uh, acquaintance established again on the way to the master. Compared to the other 12, he has a unique experience. Right. And, uh, and and we'll, we'll get to that. We'll kind of come back to this a little bit when we get to chapter 12. Um, but yeah, and that might have been, um, you know, we don't know how much uh, the Corinthians did or didn't know about Paul, but Relative to the other apostles, he's unique in that he wasn't with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Yeah, he mentioned himself, I'm in outer season or something to that, you know, meaning that much later than when the other 11 were yeah. with him. Yeah. So finally here, as we kind of close out this chapter and this thought real quick, what can a true apostle boast in? Um, picking up in 17, verse 17. 
Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. And I think that's very much along the lines of what we've been talking about here. Um, the idea of apostleship, it is not something we can um, boast in ourselves or that they could boast in. Um, it's not something we can commend ourselves to. It's something that is ordained, given by God, by, by Christ. Um, and so, you know, a true apostle, they boast in the Lord, not in themselves. Um, their praise is directed towards the Lord, not themselves. Likely something that these false apostles in Corinth, uh, I think we get the idea that they were very much about self-praise, self-promotion. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, yeah. And so um, the idea is these, the idea of apostleship, it is, Spiritual, it's God ordained, um, and not reflective of any um, self promotion or physical power. So, what you're saying is uh, they're approved by God and they're boasting in because they were worthy enough to be selected by Him, right? I, yeah, I, I mean, that's what, that's what Paul is saying. Um, you know, I think that's what he's implying here when he says, um, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. He's boasting in the Lord, not in what his own deeds are. Because um, in, chapter tw- in chapter 12, he's going to talk about being made perfect in his weakness. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, even though he has these um, weaknesses, these physical flaws, that through God's power, through God, you're able to see God glorified, even though Paul has these weaknesses. And so um, it's, it's, it's not me focus, it's Christ focus. Um, yep. Yep. Did you raise your hand? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's move on to chapter uh, 11 here. Um, Paul here is going to start his condemnation of the false apostles. Um, so first in that, um, he's going to highlight that the church is being seduced by false teachers or false apostles. Picking up in verse 1 here. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, then what we have proclaimed or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Um, Paul's highlighting here, so he's using the context of marriage here, the imagery of marriage, um, and this idea of being seduced away, seduced away from your first love or from your, your marriage. Um, and this idea, uh, he uses the imagery of Eve and the serpent, um, and we're going to talk about this more as we go through this chapter, but um, this idea that he is, that these false apostles, they're, they're, they're delivering these half-truths, so to speak, um, I think as we'll kind of see and explain a little bit later on, but, you know, about, about the gospel. And so Paul is clearly warning them, you know, do not be led away. You've, you've heard the gospel. You know the truth. Do not be deceived by this... Um, what, whatever it is that these false apostles make it sound pleasing as. Um, whatever, whatever, their, whatever their spin is, whatever their um, angle is, don't be led astray. You know the truth, you've heard the truth, um, and you heard it directly from me, an apostle. Um, you heard it from you know, someone, the, the individual who gave you spiritual gifts, who brought spiritual gifts to you. Um, don't be led astray. Don't be seduced um, by these false teachers. Um, yeah. Moving on, the accusations that these false teachers have made, that these false uh, apostles have made um, against Paul, they are false. Paul's going to highlight that here. Um, starting in verse 5. Indeed, I consider that I am not 
in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Um, I think Paul very clearly, very plainly made it to them, uh, made it clear his knowledge to them. Um, he was with them in person. He wrote them, he's written them multiple letters um, at this point. This is the second, if not third letter that he has written to them. Um, and so he's made it clear, I think, his knowledge um, and who he is as an apostle. Um, real quick here, when Paul is talking about these super apostles in this verse, he's not talking or referencing uh, Peter or John. He's, he's making, um, I think, what we would call a sarcastic uh, comment in reference to these false apostles, these false teachers. Um, and he's really continuing his case, case against them. Um, and, how, you know, he's... He's working to compare and contrast himself against them. Um, picking up again in verse 7 here. Or do I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches um, by accepting support from them in order to serve you. He, I think he's using quite a bit of sarcasm here in these verses, um, talking about the super apostles and then, you know, this, um, this language of, you know, have I, have I robbed you or, or have I robbed other churches? Um, you know, th this idea that Paul has done some wrong by giving, uh, giving them something or, or giving them the gospel for free. Um, and I think that's probably a fair thing that, uh, not a fair thing, but I think that is something that these uh, false apostles would have exploited um, to some degree. You know, we have, um, we have sayings in our time. Uh, one of those things is the best things in life are free. I'm sure everyone's heard that. Um, but to counter that, if it's too good to be true, then it probably is. And this idea that Paul is offering um, the gospel for free, you know, unspoken, that's probably, they're trying to leverage that against him and say, you know, these false teachers, these false apostles saying, well, you know, you should be paying us because it gives the illusion of, of something that is more better, even though it's absolutely not. Does that make sense? Agree, disagree? Um, moving on to verse 9 here. Um, and when I was with you and was in need... I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. Paul's very clear. He is not going to burden um, the Corinthians um, for monetary support. And I, he's trying to do that for their benefit, to their benefit, um, and yet it turns out to be something that they are really trying to use against him, or certain individuals are trying to use against him um, unfairly. Um, verse 10 here. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Um, these false apostles, they want the position that Paul and the other apostles have, but they want to charge for it. Um, and Paul's not going to allow uh, them and their actions to undermine the truth and the work that he is doing. Um, he wants to make it clear to the Corinthians the distinction between himself, a real apostle, what the real apostles are doing, versus um, these false apostles and who they are. Um, he, he's not going to allow them to um, deter or detract um, from his ministry. Picking up in verse 13, who is really behind these false apostles? Because I, th I think this is an important point, and we'll, we'll spend a little more time here. Um, verse 13, For such men are fa false apostles, 
deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Ultimately, the real problem here is Satan. It's not the false apostles. It's Satan who is, um, Paul's classifying here as their, um, you know, as their leader, and these false apostles are Satan, servants of Satan. Um, and this idea that you know, these servants of Satan, whether knowingly or not, you know, whether they know they're servants of Satan or not, they are disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. Um, and Dennis, I couldn't help but think about our class Sunday morning downstairs in 1 Peter 3, 12. You want to read, can you, sorry to put you on the spot, can you read 1 Peter 3, 21, I'm sorry, 3, 21 um, for us? Because I think in here, um, one of the things as I read through this, it, and after talking about class this past Sunday morning, the idea of, I think there's a great lesson in here for us, in that there is a great, if not the most, destruction to the church in what are half-truths. Um, so you want to read First Peter 3.12? Uh, 21. Or 21, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dennis. So we're, we're studying through First Peter on Sunday mornings, and the idea, we, we talked about it a lot this past Sunday um, downstairs, but, you know, the idea of how certain, many good people view baptism as non-essential when the inspired word of God is so, seems so clear to me that it, it is without question the only way to salvation. It is what saves you, is what Peter says. And... Um, I couldn't help but think about this idea of these, um, what Paul terms here as, um, you know, this idea that these, there are false, false apostles, deceitful workers who disguise themselves as, he says, apostles of Christ. I think today we could say it's Christians. Um, but it's even this idea that, um, you know, that it's no surprise that servants of Satan disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. And, are sharing half truths and it's it's destruction to so many. It's very unfortunate, but it was in the church in AD 55, 56 when this was approximately written. It's in the church, something that we deal with today. Um, thoughts, questions, comments on that? Okay, we'll keep marching on here. We're about halfway there. Um, Verse, wait a second here. Okay, marks of a true apostle. We're getting back to this. Marks of a true apostle here. Um, picking up in verse 11, or, or chapter 11, verse 16, excuse me. Um, I'm going to refrain from reading 16 through 33 here, just for the sake of time. Um, but in this section, Paul is, he's going to highlight all these different trials and tribulations and struggles um, that he's endured. And it's this idea that a true apostle endures this great suffering from the church. And we, you know, we understand from a historical context that of all the apostles, um, 12 of them were martyred, is, our, is what I'm... Uh, mar minds and historians much smarter than me have come to the conclusion of 12 of them were martyred, with the exception of John, um, who uh, lived a ripe old age. Uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here's what, uh, these, are, these are some of the things that Paul uh, lists in this text um, that he has had to endure. He was considered a fool and considered illegitimate. I think he's really, he's definitely talking directly to the Corinthians about those two. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are others who, I mean, there, I know there are others who um, would have labeled him such things. Um, but those are absolutely would be hurtful things. I don't think anyone would want to endure that. Um, but then he moves into physical things. He endured 39 lashes five times. He was beaten with rods 
three times. He was stoned just once, apparently. He was shipwrecked three times. That one, I can't imagine being shipwrecked. Of all the things on there, that's the scariest to me. Um, I, I don't know. Shipwrecked three times. In danger from false brothers. Um, often hungry and thirsty. Paul endured these great hardships, these struggles, these trials, these tribulations, um, for the benefit of the church. And I think he highlights this here to really compare himself and contrast himself to these false apostles. Because I think it's very clear that they are not um, in any way, shape, or form enduring that same type of um, persecution. Um, one of the things I've seen lately, too, which I think is interesting, um, is, uh, I can't remember where I saw this or the context of it, but it was talking about, um, it was this guy, and he was, it was his, um, oh, he was talking about why, like, how he converted to Christianity or, or what made him believe in the Bible. And he said the idea that these apostles were willing to endure all these types of things and always confirmed without question and um, um, promoted, you know, Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. And uh, he was comparing that to, like, earthly humans. And his, his actual comparison, he was somehow tied up in uh, Watergate with Nixon and how, like, the guys who were involved in that, like, uh, over a 48-hour period just all gave in and, like, were trying to rat each other out. And so, But it, it was his idea that, like, these 12 individuals or 13 individuals were willing to die over what they believed in. They never wavered, and they all had the same story and idea of who Jesus was. And I thought that was a really interesting um, thought and testimony. Um, but the marks of a true apostle here, um, one of the things that I think is very um, telling about Paul, as he's going through and listing all these different things, we come to verse 28 here, which I did want to pull out for us. Um, and it says, and apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me. Or th yeah, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Um, and I wish I understood Greek, and I wish I could have researched that in Greek um, to maybe glean what it truly means. But as I read that um, in our English translations, I have to believe that that is some sort of deep emotional concern care bond that, that Paul has for not only the church at Corinth, but the church abroad, um, that he is so willing to endure all these physical hardships, um, but at the same time, he has, he's still focused on this great concern, this great care for all these churches. And you know, when, whenever we read any letter of Paul's, um, it always, he, he generally always starts with, you know, I remember you in my prayers, and, and um, he, he's, the idea, and, and I think he's sincere in that, the idea that he is praying um, daily and concerned about these um, churches that he has helped establish and their growth, um, both spiritual growth as well as growth in spreading the gospel um, beyond what he starts and establishes. Um, Questions or thoughts on that before we move on? You know, if you've been a Christian for a long time or most of your life, and I'm speaking only for myself, others may agree or disagree, but we can get a little deep in the, in the weeds sometimes of, of a doctrine or creed or something like that, and then you speak to your friend who says, what gets me is all these guys willing to die for Jesus. So yep. Sometimes they simply And I mean, I think it's very reflective of, you know, we think of John as the apostle of love, but I think that's very much love on Paul's 
part that motivates him to do that. And, um, you know, I think that is something, one of the things that I think is interesting as I read through Paul's writings, and especially um, in Romans, but also here, like these things that he models his life for as a um, apostle um, or that, you know, he would, he would lay out for elders or deacons or whatever. Those are all like what everyone should be trying to live their life for and aspire to. And, um, and really the root of it is it comes down to love, love one another um, and have this deep care. Good. Any, any other questions or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Now, going back to your point on just false doctrine, I mean, I, I do think that is so scary to think about. And, it, and it, Paul doesn't term it this way, but I would term it like in these half truths. Like, you can go, we could go any to any quote unquote church here in Poplar Bluff, and I'm sure we can hear things that are truly what the Bible says, but it's not taking the complete whole context of the Bible, and that right. is what is so very scary. Um, and caution for us to be diligent in studying and growing and trying to understand um, what is the truth. Um, no, absolutely. Good, good points, good comments. Um, let's get on to this uh, caught up in the third heaven he's going to talk about here. So another mark of a true apostle is that a true apostle enjoys um, communion with Christ. Um, picking up in chapter 12, verse 1 here. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man who, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Um, and just real quick, that third heaven, that's what the Jews believed as where God resides. Like that was, so Paul's saying he knows a man I think, I think Paul's speaking about himself here in a roundabout way. Um, he's speaking about himself, but he's effectively telling them that he was where God, God is. He, um, and so, 
Um, I know a man who was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool. For I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Kind of circling back here to our outline. Um, This idea that a true apostle enjoys communion with Christ. You know, the whole thing that I think Paul is highlighting here as we talk about comparing and contrasting himself to these false apostles is that um, he has spoken with Christ. He's he's been in a presence or place um, in some way, shape, or form. He doesn't know in the body or in the spirit. But he's been somewhere and done something that no one else can claim. Um, And that's part of what makes him an apostle, among many other things. Um, And again, this might have been to counter, um, you know, one commentary thought it was to counter this idea that maybe Paul isn't an apostle or a true apostle because he wasn't with Christ's followers on earth. Um, And so, you know, Paul was given this special experience. Um, to help his validity as apostle. That, that was a speculation piece. Um, but Paul, he's, he is too humble to boast about this great experience. Um, but again, only an apostle could speak about these things. Um, and I think, you know, as we think about what he's trying to, the point he's trying to make here with regards to these false apostles, um, that's, that's the point he is trying to make. Um, now, we could go on and speculate for, um, quite a while now as to what this thorn in the flesh was um, and different things. And um, I think there's lots of different ideas, but ultimately, um, I don't know that matters to us, but it, it's this idea that something somehow hindered Paul. Um, but in reality, even though it hindered Paul in a physical way, it magnified the greatness of God in Paul's ministry. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the, the words here that, um, Paul ends with here in verse 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, I think those things, when we rely on Christ for our weaknesses, those, that, that verbiage, that, that language still holds true for us today. Um, you know, it's, it's not so much what we can do. It's what we can, what Christ can do through us. Um. Questions or comments or thoughts as we wrap up these two and a half chapters? Getting you out of here before 755. (laughs) Okay, well, I don't have anything else. I'm a minute early, I think. So, anyway, appreciate y'all. It's good to be here. I think Mitchell's back next week. I guess, is he in Dexter tonight or Bernie? 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 I've not been to the metropolis of Bernie. Don't blink. I'll try not to. Everyone have a good week.